Chapter Thirteen of Henry D. Thoreau. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jane Dever. Henry D. Thoreau by Franklin Benjamin Sanborn. Chapter Thirteen. Life death and immortality the life of thoreau naturally divides itself into three parts his apprenticeship from birth to the summer of eighteen thirty seven when he left harvard college his journey work wander yar from eighteen thirty seven to eighteen forty nine when he appeared as an author with his first book and his mastership not of a college a merchantman or a mechanic art but of the trade and mystery of writing he had aspired to live and study and practice so that he could write to use his own words sentences which suggest far more than they say which have an atmosphere about them which do not report an old but make a new impression to frame such sentences as these he said as durable as a roman aqueduct was the art of writing coveted by him sentences which are expressive towards which so many volumes so much life went which lie like boulders on the page up and down or across not mere repetition but creation in which a man might sell his ground or cattle to build it was this thirst for final and concentrated expression and not love of fame or literary aspirations as poor greeley put it which urged him on to write for printing he cared little and few authors since shakespeare have been less anxious to publish what they wrote of the seven volumes of his works first printed and twenty more which may be published some day only two the week and walden appeared in his lifetime though the material for two more had been scattered about in forgotten magazines and newspapers for his friends to collect after his death of his first works and some of his best it could be said as thomas wharton said in seventeen eighty one of his friend's grace verses i yet reflect with pain upon the cool reception which these noble odes the progress of poetry and the bard met at their first publication it appeared there were not twenty people in england who liked them this disturbed thoreau's friends but not himself he rather rejoiced in the slow sale of his first book and when the balance of the edition more than seven hundred copies out of one thousand came back upon his hands unsold in eighteen fifty five and earlier he told me with glee that he had made an edition of seven hundred volumes to his library and all of his own composition o oh, solitude obscurity meanness he exclaims in eighteen fifty six to his best friend blake i never triumph so as when i have the least success in my neighbor's eyes of course pride had something to do with this it was a wild stock of pride as burke said of lord keppel on which the tenderest of all hearts had grafted the milder virtues both pride and piety led him to write fame cannot tempt the bard who's famous with his god nor laurel him reward who has his maker's nod though often ranked as an unbeliever and too scornful in some of his expressions concerning the religion of other men thoreau was in truth deeply religious sincerity and devotion were his marked traits and both are seen in his verses from the same poem inspiration so often quoted i will then trust the love untold which not my worth or want hath bought which wooed me young and woos me old and to this evening hath me brought thoreau's business in life was observation thought and writing to which at last reading was essential he read much but studied more nor was his reading that indiscriminate miscellaneous perusal of everything printed which has become the vice of this age he read books of travel scientific books authors of original merit 
but few newspapers, of which he had a very poor opinion. Read not the Times, read the Eternities, he said. Nor did he admire the magazines or their editors greatly. He quarrelled with Putnam's magazine in 1853-54, to and in 1858, after yielding to the question of Mr. Emerson that he should contribute to the Atlantic, in consequence of a dispute with Mr. Lowell, its editor, about the omission of a sentence in one of his articles, he published no more in that magazine until the year of his death, 1862, when Mr. Fields obtained from him some of his choicest manuscripts. He spent the last months of his life in revising these, and they continued to appear for some years after his death. Those which were published in the Atlantic in 1878 are passages from his journals, selected by his friend Blake, who long had the custody of his manuscripts. These consist chiefly of his journals in 39 volumes, many parts of which had already been printed, either by Thoreau himself, by his sister Sophia, or his friend Channing, who in 1873 published a life of Thoreau, containing many extracts from the journals, which had never before been printed. When we speak of his words, we should also include Mr. Channing's book also, half of which, at least, is from Thoreau's pen. His method in writing was peculiarly his own, though it bore some external resemblance to that of his friends Emerson and Alcott. Like them, he early began to keep a journal, which became both diary and commonplace book. But while they noted down the thoughts which occurred to them, without premeditation or consecutive arrangement, Thoreau made studies and observations for his journal as carefully and habitually as he noted the angles and distances in surveying a Concord farm. In all his daily walks and distant journeys, he took notes on the spot of what occurred to him and these often very brief and symbolic he carefully wrote out as soon as he could get time in his diary not classified by topics but just as they had come to him to these he added his daily meditations sometimes expressed in verse especially in the years between eighteen thirty seven and eighteen fifty but generally in close and pertinent prose many details are found in his diaries but not such as are common in the diaries of other men not trivial but significant details from these daily entries he made up his essays his lectures and his volumes all being slowly and with much deliberation and revision brought into the form in which he gave them to the public after that he scarcely changed them at all they had received the last imprint of his mind, and allowed them to stand and speak for themselves. But before printing, they underwent constant change, by addition, erasure, transposition, correction, and combination. A given lecture might be two years or twenty years in preparation, or it might be, like his defense of John Brown, copied with little change from the pages of his diary for the fortnight previous but that was an exceptional case and thoreau was stirred and quickened by the campaign and capture of brown as perhaps he had never been before the thought of that man's position and fate he said is spoiling many a man's day here at the north for other thinking if any one who has seen john brown in concord can pursue successfully any other train of thought i do not know what he is made of if there is any such who gets his usual allowance of sleep, I will warrant him to fatten easily under any circumstances which do not touch his body or purse. I put a piece of paper and a pencil under my pillow, and when I could not sleep, I wrote in the dark. I was so absorbed in him as to be surprised whenever I detected the routine of the natural world surviving still, or met persons going about in their affairs indifferent. The fact that Thoreau noted down his thoughts by night, as well as by day, appears also from an entry in one of his journals, where he is describing the coming on of day, as witnessed by him at the close of a September night in Concord. Some bird flies over, he writes. It was a cuckoo. It is yet so dark that I have dropped my pencil and cannot find it. 
No writer of modern times, in fact, was so much awake and abroad at night, or has described better the phenomena of darkness and of moonlight. It is interesting to note some dates and incidents concerning a few of Thoreau's essays. The celebrated chapter on Friendship in the Week was written in the winter of 1847-48, to soon after he left Walden, and while he was a member of Mr. Emerson's household during the absence of his friend in Europe. On the 13th of January, 1848, Mr. Alcott notes in his diary, Henry Thoreau came in after my hours with the children, and we had a good deal of talk on the modes of popular influence. He read me a manuscript essay of his on friendship, which he has just written, and which I thought superior to anything I had heard. To the same period, or a little later, belong those verses called The Departure, which declare, under a similitude, Thoreau's relations with one family of his friends. In 1843, when he first met Henry James, Lucretia Mott, and others who have since been famous, in the pleasant seclusion of Staten Island, he wrote a translation of The Seven Against Thieves, which has never been printed some translations from pindar printed in the dial in eighteen forty four and two articles for the new york democratic review called paradise to be regained and the landlord thoreau left a vast amount of manuscript in the words of his sister who was his literary executor until her death in eighteen seventy six when she committed her trust to his worcester friend mr harrison blake she was aided in the revision and publication of the exertions maine woods letters and other volumes which she issued from eighteen sixty two to eighteen sixty six by mr emerson mr channing and other friends mr emerson having undertaken that selection of letters and poems from his massive correspondence and his preserved verses which appeared in eighteen sixty five his purpose as he said to miss thoreau was to exhibit in that volume a most perfect piece of stoicism and he fancied that she had marred his classic statue by inserting some tokens of natural affection which the domestic letters showed miss thoreau said that it did not seem quite honest to henry to leave out such passages mr fields the publisher agreed with her and a few of them were retained his correspondence, as a whole, is much more affectionate and less pugnacious than what then would appear from the published volume. He was fond of dispute, but those who knew him best loved him most. Of his last illness, his sister said, It was not possible to be sad in his presence. No shadow of gloom attaches to anything in my mind connected with my precious brother. He has done much to strengthen the faith of his friends henry's whole life impresses me as a grand miracle walking once with mr alcott soon after he passed his eightieth birthday as we faced the lovely western sky in december the old pythagorean said i always think of thoreau when i look at a sunset and i then remembered it was at that hour thoreau usually walked along the village street under the arch of trees with the sunset sky seen through their branches he said to me in his last illness, added Alcott, I shall leave the world without a regret. That was the saying either of a grand egotist or of a deeply religious soul. Thoreau was both, and both his egotism and his devotion offended many of those who met him. His aversion to the companionship of men was partly religious, a fondness for the inward life, and partly egotism and scorn for frivolity emerson says his life is so unprofitable and shabby for the most part writes thoreau in eighteen fifty four that he is driven to all sorts of resources and among the rest to men i tell him we differ only in our resources mine is to get away from men they very rarely affect me as grand or beautiful but i know that there is a sunrise and a sunset every day I have seen more men than usual lately, and well as I was acquainted with one, I am surprised to find what vulgar fellows they are. In 1859 he wrote to Mr. Blake, I have lately got back to that glorious society called Solitude, where we meet our friends continually, and can imagine the outside world also to be peopled. 
Yet some of my acquaintance would fain hustle me into the almshouse for the sake of society, as if I were pining for that diet, when I seem to myself a most befriended man, and find constant employment. However, they do not believe a word I say. They have got a club, the handle of which is in the Parker House at Boston, and with this they beat me from time to time, expecting to make me tender or mincemeat, and so fit for a club to dine off. The doctors are all agreed that I am suffering for want of society. Was never a case like it. First, I did not know what I was suffering at all. Secondly, as an Irishman might say, I had thought it was indigestion of the society I got. Yet Thoreau knew the value of society, and avoided it oftentimes only because he was too busy. To his friend Rickardson, who reproached him for ceasing to answer letters, he wrote in November 1860, just before he took the final cold that terminated in consumption and ended his life prematurely, Friend Rickardson, you know that I never promise to correspond with you, and so, when I do, I do more than I promise such are my pursuits and habits that i rarely go abroad and it is quite a habit with me to decline invitations to do so not that i could not enjoy such visits if i were not otherwise occupied i have enjoyed very much my visits to you and my rides in your neighbourhood and am sorry that i cannot enjoy such things oftener but life is short and there are other things also to be done I admit that you are more social than I am, and more attentive to the common courtesies of life, but this is partly for the reason that you have fewer or less exacting private pursuits. Not to have written a note for a year is with me a very venial offense. I think I do not correspond with any one so often as once in six months. I have a faint recollection of your invitation referred to, but I suppose I had no new or particular reason for declining, and so made no new statement. I have felt that you would be glad to see me almost whenever I got ready to come, but I only offer myself as a rare visitor, and a still rarer correspondent. I am very busy, after my fashion, little as there is to show for it, and feel as if I could not spend many days nor dollars in travelling for the shortest visit must have a fair margin to it and the days thus affect the weeks you know nevertheless we cannot forego these luxuries altogether please remember me to your family i have a very pleasant recollection of your fireside and i trust that i shall revisit it also of your shanty and the surrounding regions he did make a last visit to this friend in august eighteen sixty one after his return from minnesota whither he went with young Horace Mann in June. And it was Mr. Ricketson that Sophia Thoreau, two weeks after her brother's death, wrote the following account of his last illness. Concord, May 20, 1862 Dear friend, profound joy mingles with my grief. I feel as if something very beautiful had happened, not death. Although Henry is with us no longer, yet the memory of his sweet and virtuous soul must ever cheer and comfort me. My heart is filled with praise to God for the gift of such a brother, and may I never distrust the love and wisdom of him who made him, and who has now called him to labor in more glorious fields than earth affords. You ask for some particulars relating to Henry's illness. I feel like saying that Henry was never affected, never reached by it, I never before saw such a manifestation of the power of spirit over matter. Very often I have heard him tell his visitors that he enjoyed existence as well as ever. He remarked to me that there was as much comfort in perfect disease as in perfect health, the mind always conforming to the condition of the body. The thought of death, he said, could not begin to trouble him. His thoughts had entertained him all his life, and still did. When he had wakeful nights, he would ask me to arrange the furniture so as to make fantastic shadows on the wall, and he wished his bed was in the form of a shell that he might curl up in it. He considered occupation as necessary for the sick as those in health, and has accomplished a vast amount of labor during the past few months in preparing some papers for the press. He did not cease to call for his manuscript till the last day of his life. 
During his long illness I never heard a murmur escape him, or the slightest wish expressed to remain with us. His perfect contentment was truly wonderful. None of his friends seemed to realize how very ill he was, so full of life and good cheer did he seem. One friend, as if by way of consolation, said to him, Well, Mr. Thoreau, we must all go. Henry replied, When I was a very little boy, I learned that I must die, and set that down. So, of course, I am not disappointed now. Death is as near to you as it is to me. There is very much that I should like to write you about my precious brother, had I time and strength. I wish you to know how very gentle, lovely, and submissive he was in all his ways. His little study bed was brought down into our front parlor when he could no longer walk with our assistance, and every arrangement pleased him. The devotion of his friends was most rare and touching. His room was made fragrant by the gifts of flowers from young and old, fruit of every kind which the season afforded, and game of all sorts were sent him. It was really pathetic, the way in which the town was moved to minister to his comfort. Total strangers sent grateful messages, remembering the good he had done them. All this attention was fully appreciated and very gratifying to Henry. He would sometimes say, I should be ashamed to stay in this world after so much has been done for me. I could never repay my friends. And they remembered him to the last. Only about two hours before he left us, Judge Hoar called with a bouquet of hyacinths fresh from his garden, which Henry smelt and said he liked. And a few minutes after he was gone, another friend came with a dish of his favorite jelly. I can never be grateful enough for the gentle, easy exit which was granted him. At seven o'clock, Tuesday morning, he became restless and desired to be moved. Dear mother, Aunt Louisa, and myself were with him. His self-possession did not forsake him. A little after eight, he asked to be raised quite up. His breathing grew fainter and fainter, and without the slightest struggle, he left us at nine o'clock. But not alone. Our Heavenly Father was with us. Your last letter reached us by the evening mail on Monday. Henry asked me to read it to him, which I did. He enjoyed your letters and felt disappointed not to see you again. Mr. Blake and Mr. Brown came twice to visit him since January. They were present at his funeral, which took place in the church. Mr. Emerson read such an address as no other man could have done. It is a source of great satisfaction that one so gifted knew and loved my brother, and is prepared to speak such brave words about him at this time. The Atlantic Monthly for July will contain Mr. Emerson's memories of Henry. I hope that you saw a notice of the services on Friday, written by Mr. Fields, in the transcript. Let me thank you for your very friendly letters. I trust we shall see you in Concord anniversary week. It would give me pleasure to make the acquaintance of your family, of whom my brother has so often told me. If convenient, will you please bring the amber type of Henry which was taken last autumn in New Bedford? I am interested to see it. Mr. Channing will take the crayon likeness to Boston this week to secure some photographs. My intention was to apologize for not writing you at this time, but I must now trust to your generosity to pardon this hasty letter, written under a great pressure of cares and amidst frequent interruptions. My mother unites me in very kind regards to your family. Yours truly, S. E. Thoreau. To Parker Pillsbury, who would fain talk with Thoreau in this last winter concerning the next world, the reply was, one world at a time. To a young friend, Myron Benton, he wrote a few weeks before death, Concord, March 21, 1862. Dear Sir, I thank you for your very kind letter, which, ever since I received it, I have intended to answer before I died however briefly. I am encouraged to know that, so far as you are concerned, I have not written my books in vain. I was particularly gratified some years ago when one of my friends and neighbors said, I wish you would write another book. 
write it for me. He is actually more familiar with what I have written than I am myself. I am pleased when you say that in the week you like especially those little snatches of poetry interspersed through the book, for these, I suppose, are the least attractive to most readers. I have not been engaged in any particular work on botany or the like, though if I were to live I should have much to report on natural history generally. You ask particularly after my health. I suppose that I have not many months to live, but of course I know nothing about it. I may add that I am enjoying existence as much as ever, and regret nothing. Yours truly, Henry D. Thoreau, by Sophia E. Thoreau. With an unfaltering trust in God's mercies, wrote Ellery Channing, and never deserted by his good genius, he most bravely and unsparingly passed down the inclined plane of a terrible malady, pulmonary consumption. Working steadily at the completing of his papers to his last hours, or so long as he could hold pencil in his trembling fingers, yet if he did get a little sleep to comfort him in this year's campaign of sleepless affliction he was sure to interest those about him in his singular dreams more than usually fantastic he said once that having got a few moments of repose sleep seemed to hang round his bed in festoons he declared uniformly that he preferred to endure with a clear mind the worst penalties of suffering rather than be plunged in a turbid dream by narcotics assuredly he knew not aught save resignation he did mightily cheer and console those whose strength was less his every instant now his least thought and work sacredly belonged to them dearer than his rapidly perishing life whom he should so quickly leave behind once or twice he shed tears upon hearing a wandering musician in the street playing some tune of his childhood he might never hear again he wept and said to his mother give him some money for me northward he turneth through a little door and scarce three steps ere music's golden tongue flattered to tears this aged man and poor but no already had his death bell rung the joys of all his life were said and sung he died on the sixth of may eighteen sixty two and had a public funeral from the parish church a few days later on his coffin his friend channing placed several inscriptions among them this hail to thee o man who hast come from the transitory place to the imperishable this sentiment may stand as faintly marking thoreau's deep vital conviction of immortality of which he never had entertained a doubt in his life there was in his view of the world and its maker no room for doubt so that when he was once asked superfluously what he thought of a future world and its compensations he replied those were voluntaries i did not take having confined himself to the foreordained course of things he is buried in the village cemetery quaintly named sleepy hollow with his family and friends about him one of whom surviving him for a few years said as she looked upon his low headstone on the hillside concord is henry's monument covered with suitable inscriptions by his own hand end of chapter thirteen recording by jane dever End of Henry D. Thoreau by Franklin Benjamin Sanborn